beautifully done. Good morning to you. Oh, it's good to see you in God's house. It's great to see you. I would like to share with you a few announcements to get us started. Uh, some good things to be aware of. I'm going to attempt to do this in chronological order. Here it goes. Tomorrow, July 4th, the church office is closed. That makes good sense, doesn't it? Yeah, I think everybody who is in the church office needs to have a good day off. So uh, the 4th, the office is closed. Wednesday night, however, Wednesday night, July 6th, will be a new women's Bible study led by Phyllis Gamble, and it's going to be great. I've heard so many good things about the study that they are going to be undertaking, so by all means, jump in on that. If you have any questions about that, uh, please contact Phyllis or Stacy. Um, on the 10th, there is a VBS volunteer training session uh, with Stacy. Lunch will be provided. It'll be at 12 noon to 2 o'clock. So if you have volunteered for VBS, this is your opportunity to uh, get clear about what you'll be doing. It will be a good time. Uh, one other uh, announcement with a date, and that's July 14th. The Golden Agers are going to Simply Natural Creamery. I expected a big amen on that one. I think it's going to be a really wonderful time, so way to go, Vernon, for picking a great location <laughs> for the outing. That's going to be great. Um, one thing I do want to mention also, uh, church directories are available. We uh, forgot to mention that uh, in last week's service, but they are in alphabetical order here on the front pew. By all means, if you've not yet picked up your church directory, please do. Uh, in the next week or two, we'll have to mail out the ones that have not been picked up. Uh, so if you haven't picked up yours, please pick them up. Or, in fact, if you know of somebody who is not able to make it to church, but you know that you're going to see them, you're welcome to pick up their directory and hand deliver it that way, too. Uh, that's great. So, friends, are you ready to worship God? Are you ready to give God thanks for the many blessings that we have received? This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning on this day before the 4th of July. <laughs> Would you stand as we sing This Is My Country that goes into um, God Bless America, and then we will say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Would you stand?
Kids, join me. Ha ha, come on down. Are you the only one? <laughs> Everybody else is at the beach. Well, it's just you and me. I like your shirt. You're looking very sharp today. Well, thank you. I wore my red and blue tie and a white shirt. We match. I've got a question for you. We could sing a duet. How about that? We match so well. <laughs> I wasn't actually suggesting we do that. But I, I, I do want to ask you some questions. Uh, what are you looking forward to in celebrating the 4th of July? <laughs> Ice cream. Ice cream is excellent. Ooh, Myrtle Beach is fun. That's good. I like it. <laughs> yeah. What's your backup plan? So there's this kid that comes here. His name is Colin. Yeah. His grandma lives in my neighborhood. And last night I heard them setting off fireworks and firecrackers. And what they did is they had a trail of firecrackers all the way down to the stop sign. No way. <laughs> so I start running outside. Mom, yeah. Mom. And it's just a trail of firecrackers. Wow. Going well, well, that is pretty exciting. It was. Yeah. I like that. I feel like I need to go to Colin's house, too. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, so uh, let me ask you another question. Do you know what we're celebrating? July 4th in America and the Army. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and sure. the country in general. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Well done. Um, and I think one of the things that is most important about why we celebrate this day uh, is the idea of freedom. And you know, we have some freedoms that not everybody has, right? Did you know that in some parts of the world, they are not able to gather together and worship Jesus on Sundays? Isn't that sad? It does disappoint me too, yeah. And, you know, in fact, I saw a video one time, and it really moved me. It was, uh, if I remember right, it was in China, which is one of the places where it's very difficult to worship Jesus publicly. And uh, they're not allowed to have copies of the Bible. And so somebody had snuck in a suitcase full of Bibles. And they brought it to uh, one of the underground churches. They don't actually meet underground, but it's just a way of saying kind of a secret meeting of Christians. Exactly, like the Underground Railroad. And what they did is they passed out these Bibles to everybody there. And the people that were there that got a copy of the Bible, they were hugging it to their chest. They were even crying because they never thought they would have their own copy of God's Word. And, you know, uh, so on the one hand, it's a terrible thing to, for them to have to fear to be able to worship. On the other hand, it really makes them appreciate and love Jesus even more, Yeah. So I think one thing as we celebrate freedom is that we don't take for granted that these things are just obvious or natural or easy because so many people in other places don't have the same kind of freedom. So we should give thanks to God that we have the freedom to love Jesus and worship openly. Doesn't that sound like a good thing? Well, that's part of what we're celebrating today. So I'm going to say a prayer of thanksgiving. Would you join me with that? Great. God, we give you thanks that you give many good gifts, and in, in this place we are so fortunate that we have the gift of being able to assemble. We get to come together, and we get to pray, we get to worship, we get to read your word. We, we have so many freedoms. So God, we ask that you not only preserve our freedoms, we ask that you help us to use them well. Help us to love your word. Help us to Remember to worship together because it's a privilege. It's an honor. And we give you thanks for that. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thanks. There's no children's church today, so you can go back and sit in there. Thanks. Good morning again. And welcome as we celebrate our independence today. 
but many things we just take for granted. Uh, this morning we want to mention some of the folks that need prayer, that have needs and concerns, and also we have a praise. Um, last week I told you about Judy's grandson, Grayson Caldwell, who had suffered uh, second degree burns. Uh, from falling in a fire pit maybe a couple of weeks earlier. He's doing well. He's been released. And that's just a praise that his healing process has already begun. So Amen. to God be the glory for that. Uh, Mike Massengill this week uh, did the lipotripsy thing. He's been suffering with a kidney stone for several weeks. It was not as successful as they would have liked for it to have been. Carla told me they hit him like 4,000 times. Uh, I guess that's 4,000 vibrations. They got minimal fragmentation, so he's looking at having to have to redo that procedure at some time. So continue to remember Mike. He just got one of those tough stones in life. So, but uh, God is still in charge. So uh, continue to remember him. Wayne Sutton. I saw Wayne somewhere this morning. Oh, he's in the back. Uh, Wayne is, uh, is, is still going through his treatments and is going to begin some more, so continue to remember him also. And thank you for being here today, Wayne. I know it was a struggle to get out. Uh, Joe Gurley, as we mentioned last week, is still uh, undergoing a procedure for her brain aneurysm, and she wants you to know that so you'll know what to pray for. So continue to remember Joe. Continue to remember Lewis Hill. Uh, Erna Ivy was supposed to have heart surgery this week, and I think she did, but I have not heard back from how that went, but I'm trusting it all went well with that. Teresa Howell is still undergoing treatments. Uh, Pete Carlotti will have a procedure this Friday. Uh, we're praying it all will go well with that. I know he is, so just continue to remember him. Let's remember all of our unspoken requests. Uh, military families and those who are missionaries and serving abroad, just continue to remember them. Also, our pastor search committee, I know they've been meeting. I don't know where they're at in the process, but it's good that they're meeting. That's a good sign. So continue to remember them and also that one pastor. We don't need but one. <laughs> that one pastor that God would lead to call this way. Thank you. Friends, uh, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Lord, for your many gifts, we are so thankful. For the gift of this day. For the gift of summer. And abundant crops. And, and reminders that you love and care for us. For occasions like the 4th of July that cause us to think about the many ways that we we are fortunate fortunate to to be where we are fortunate to be surrounded by the communities that we are fortunate to have freedoms that are so easily taken for granted so god may we not be may we not be slack in giving thanks for the ways that we have been so blessed and may we also not be slack in giving thanks for the ways that you've been so present to us in our times of need. For the ways that you've been present in Grayson's life as he's bounced back well from a severe burn. And the ways that you've been so kind, so present to those who are suffering and going, uh, undergoing medical treatment. You've been their rock. You've been their redeemer. You've been their comforter in times of trial, and we give you thanks. And Lord, we pray for those who are still very much undergoing difficulty and challenge. We pray that you'd strengthen them, give them hope and peace in situations that may not at all seem hopeful and certainly don't feel peaceful. May you be the source of encouragement and and light so that even in dark days we may witness to your goodness and grace 
Lord, for the many needs that are in this congregation, we ask that we would see you at work. And in the ways that we don't see you at work, strengthen our faith so that we know that you are at work even in ways that are hidden. For the deep needs that afflict our country, there are so many. We pray, God, that we'd see you at work there too. Bring peace out of polarization. Bring love and common cause to divided spaces, divided people, divided families. These are challenging days, Lord. We know it. And we know that we need you to navigate them. Be with us, Lord. The great needs that are so very present in the world around us in places like Ukraine, in places like Afghanistan, in places near and far where people suffer greatly. God, we pray that your gracious hand would be present to strengthen and support. Lord, on this day, may our hearts be full of thanksgiving and joy. May we ever be mindful of how good you've been to us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand as we sing America the Beautiful together?
There are a lot of things going on in America right now that most of us are somewhat shocked to see what's happening. And sometimes we feel a bit overwhelmed and we throw our hands up and think there's nothing we can do. But in the Bible, that is never true. And it says, if my people who were called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, I will forgive their sins and heal their lands. Will you just enjoy the presentation this morning? If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves shall humble themselves and pray. If my people which are called by my name shall see Freedom is one of those loaded words, isn't it? Mm. We all have experiences of freedom. Not just the grand patriotic kind, but just even the natural kind. For instance, at the end of a school year, every student who finishes the end of a school year feels a lot like Mel Gibson's character uh, of William Wallace at the end of Braveheart, right? They're ready to paint their face blue and shout, freedom! School's out! It's summertime. Let freedom ring, right? But freedom isn't always obvious, or at least what we do with it isn't always obvious. A, a couple years ago, I finished a particularly challenging semester, a particularly challenging school year, and, and I also had a writing project that came right on the heels of it. So I was working like a dog right up to Fourth of July weekend, and I tell you what, there is no person who has ever had senioritis more ready to paint his face blue and shout freedom than me that particular semester. I, I didn't do it, but I really wanted to crawl up on the roof and have, with blue face, shout, shout freedom. Uh, but after I got done with my imaginary shouting, I found myself saying, now what? <laughs> what do I do with that? 
I, I, I'm done with the things that have been pressing on me. I, I have some freedom. I have some space to do what I want to do. Now, what do I do with that? What do I do with the freedom that's been given me? And let me suggest that this is not just an affliction that, that strikes overworked students or, or their teachers. I think all of us are left with that same question. As great a gift as freedom is, it's also a bit of an obligation. It's also a bit of a conundrum. What do you do with freedom when you have it? As God's free and faithful people, I think that's something we need to be thinking about this weekend as we let freedom ring from sea to shining sea. What do we do with freedom? What is freedom really after all? Or maybe most important, what is the freedom that Jesus gives? What do we as God's people have to say about the nature of freedom about the gift of freedom, what does it mean to be free? Would you pray with me? God, we, we come with full hearts. We come ready to celebrate your good gifts. But we're also very aware that your gifts, well, pretty much without exception, are not only gifts, but also high callings also opportunities. Help us to see what that means. Help us to use your gifts well. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who gives us open hearts, open ears, open eyes. Amen. Friends, I think if we're to understand freedom in its fullness, we must first understand Jesus. Because freedom is one of the central things that Jesus holds out to us. Would you look with me at John chapter 8, starting in verse 31? This is what happened. Can I give you the setup to this? Jesus has been having these contentious conversations with people that, that wanted to cut out the legs from under him. They're trying to trip him up in debate. They're trying to undermine his message. And Jesus, with each and every turn, is is not ever bested by his opponents. And after one of these exchanges, it moves the people listening in a way, and, and, and in verse 31 of chapter 8, it says something fascinating. It says, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, so think about that, Jesus is not just addressing the crowd. Jesus is specifically speaking to the people who seem to be on the edge of belief. They've believed a bit in what Jesus is saying. And here's what Jesus says. If you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Can I read that one more time? Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Friends, was he promising a particular political order? Was he promising that, oh, if they only believed in, in him, then Caesar would start holding votes on a regular basis? <laughs> no. Jesus was saying, right there where you are, in your situation, whatever strife, Whatever difficulty, whatever oppression, whoever's boot is on your neck, you too can have freedom. You too can know the truth, and that truth will make you free. Oh, that's the deep message of what Jesus is up to here. Jesus promises that whatever tyrant is on the throne in Rome, you, friend, can have freedom. Oh, that's subversive. That's revolutionary. But here's the thing. The crowd did not particularly like this message. They didn't like it because they didn't like what it implied about them. Verse 33. They answered him. Now remember, these are the people that were 
believing in at least some of the things that Jesus is saying. They're, they're, they're curious, they're interested, and here's what they said. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Mm. Isn't it interesting? When we hear those words, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, oh, it inspires us, we're likely to put it on a Hallmark card, right? We're likely to cross-stitch that on a pillow. Not so his hearers, because his hearers heard what he was saying between the lines. Jesus was implying that they're not nearly as free as they think they are. We've never been slaves of anyone. How can you say we'll be set free? They're offended. Because the implication is that they're not free. The implication is that they are indeed slaves. And they didn't miss the mark. They caught accurately what Jesus was implying. You might think you're free, but... Verse 34. Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's descendants, yet you're looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. Oh my. You see what Jesus did there. He's reading the hearts. He's reading the intentions. He knows that they're kind of curious about what he's up to, but they also know that, that they're not so sure and that this whole time they've been plotting his death. Jesus is speaking to a hostile crowd, and, and he knows that his words are landing. He knows that some people are beginning to believe in him, but, but Jesus... He's willing to tell them the truth about themselves, even though he knows it's going to offend them a bit. He wants them to know that they're still slaves to sin, and they don't know it. They deny it, but it's true. Jesus won't let closing the sale get in the way of telling the truth. I think that's a point worth repeating. Jesus won't let closing the sale, get in the way of the truth. Jesus loves us too much to lie to us about the state of our souls. Jesus loves us too much to not tell us the truth about where we are. Jesus is comfortable with uncomfortable truth, and that's part of the journey with Jesus. The world, the world gives us no shortage of fun house mirrors the kind that twist and distort us in various ways, the ones that make us look far better so we feel perfectly good about ourselves. <laughs> but you, have you ever stepped in front of a funhouse mirror that makes you look extra tall and skinny? Hey, <laughs> I'm looking pretty good today. Or the funhouse mirror that twists and distorts in a way that makes you feel unworthy, unloved, unlovable. Mm. Jesus is the true and faithful friend who comes loaded with an accurate mirror. It shows us a true mirror so that we can see ourselves as God does. In the light of Christ, we get to see that we get to see what's broken and in need of healing. And, and, and we also at the same time get to see that we are beloved. You'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. That crowd listening to Jesus might have begun to believe that Jesus was saying some things worth listening to, but they didn't yet really know the truth that would set them free. And this is important because Jesus is not merely looking for believers of this sort, the kind of believer that says, you know, that Jesus has, he has some pretty good things to say. Yes, it's true. But there's such a difference between saying there's, there's some things that Jesus has, has, to, has to say that might be worth hearing, and it's very different to say that 
Indeed, this is the very word of God. The word made flesh dwelling among us that we would see God's message in bold and living color. Jesus is looking for those who are willing to encounter the truth, the kind of truth that would make them free. And what, what is that truth? Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Do you hear that? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, says Jesus in John 8. And in John 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus isn't just giving out some good ideas that will help you live a more flourishing life, your best life now. Jesus is the truth that makes us free. On this weekend, when we celebrate freedom, the kinds of freedom specifically that we get to enjoy in this country, oh, that's so wonderful. And I hear these words of Jesus, and I want to say, let freedom ring. The true and deeper freedom that lies even deeper than the civic freedoms that we enjoy, as great and good as they are. Let that kind of freedom ring. If only everyone could taste and see that the Lord is good and that his way brings freedom and life. But can I ask you, what keeps us from that kind of freedom? What keeps us from the freedom that Jesus brings? Well, we see it happening right here in this encounter with Jesus, don't we? We get offended. We get our toes stepped on and, and, and we take offense and we don't want to listen to anything more that Jesus has to say. That, that mirror is a little too accurate, if you know what I mean. Have you ever gone clothes shopping and, and, and you know, you're not so sure about what the mirror says, but what the salesperson says makes you, it kind of talks you into this is a really good idea. I think sometimes we would much rather have the persuasive salesperson than the awfully frank mirror. We get offended. We don't want to hear what Jesus has to say about ourselves. Or as Jesus put it, we have no room for his word. Mm. We don't want to make space for Jesus to have a say about how we use our freedom. Consequently, the one who is in bondage to sin tastes freedom. Just like this crowd, they tasted what Jesus had to say, and they said, oh, yeah, that, that sounds pretty good. But as soon as they saw that it would come with a cost, they turned the other way. And they went crawling back to their old, their old ways. And by the way, this is reminiscent of a, of a story from Israel's history. Do you remember how this went? Jesus, or, <laughs> Jesus was not in this part of the story. Strike that word. In the book of Exodus, long before Jesus came along, the, the people are in bondage in sin. Not only in sin, they're in bondage in slavery in Egypt. And they're stuck, and they're crying out for release, and, and God sends it. God sends Moses to deliver the people up from the land. And with no shortage of miracles and divine intervention, God releases the people from their slavery, brings them up out of the land, and takes them on a long and winding journey toward the promised land. At every step of the way, God is providing, God is leading, God is guiding, miracle after miracle, divine provision, literally sending food from heaven to nourish them. Do you remember what happened right about that? long into the journey. They got bored with all that heavenly food. They just lost its taste. They just can only take so much heavenly food, and now they're, they're starting to think about the good old days. The good old days in Egypt, when they had plenty of interesting things to eat. Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 through 6, one of my one of the most haunting but interesting, fascinating verses in all the Bible. Here we go. 
the rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and saying, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. I have to say, the, the cook part of my soul kind of jumps a little bit as I read this. I get this. The lure of the onions in Egypt. But now we've lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. We never see anything but this divine provision, this miraculous bread from heaven. We, we're so bored with it, they say. God is leading and guiding them through the wilderness to the promised land. God is providing them sustenance and life. And instead, what they have are the lingering memories of tasty things in Egypt. They have forgotten the fact that while they were eating onions, they were slaves. While they were eating onions, they were crying out to God for deliverance. But they had onions. Friends, one way that we lose our freedom is that we so crave new things, tasty things, we want our taste buds stimulated. We want excitement. We want something new. And, and then we start craving the fun parts of our slavery. And we forget that we weren't free, that we, weren't, that, that, that we were slaves. Jesus says, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What do we do with that? How do we use our freedom well, friends? Can I suggest one thing? We need to cultivate a spirit of gratitude. We need to thank God for the freedoms that we've been given. The freedom that we are here today singing God's praises, hearing God's word. Thank you, God, this is possible. We need to not only cultivate a spirit a spirit of thanksgiving for all the ways God has blessed, not only for the freedom to worship, but all the other bits of grace that sustain us, and with it gain a sense of obligation. Not as though we could ever earn it, not as though we could ever pay it back, but just a great obligation of a child to the loving, gratuitously loving nature of the Father that showers with gifts. Mm -mm -mm. We need to cultivate gratitude. Second, we need to never forget where we came from. We need to never forget that we were in Egypt once upon a time. And maybe, just maybe, if we really remember Egypt, if we really remember what bondage tastes like, Maybe we can stop wandering back, playing with it, thinking about it, reminiscing about those good old days when we had so much more freedom instead of the manna, the daily heavenly bread that we're given. Mm. And maybe, just maybe, if we remember Egypt and the bondage that we experienced, maybe we can stop looking down on those who are still there, stuck enslaved and in compassion help them to see that Christ wants to lead them out friends this weekend we need to let freedom ring we need to shout it from the rooftops and most of all we need to let folks know Jesus makes us free Jesus makes us free What's all this freedom for? Remember I, I mentioned at the beginning that we can get so excited about that glimpse of freedom, that taste of freedom, that we want to paint our face blue and shout freedom from the rooftops. But then what? What do we do with all that freedom other than saying thank you? The Apostle Paul 
addresses this in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, and then 16 to 18. Hear this. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. No longer slaves to sin. No longer slave to death, to life-stealing ways instead. Become slaves to one another. The brotherly love, the love of God and neighbor that, that is indeed the right kind of obligation the right kind of constraint on our freedom. Our freedom becomes an opportunity to serve one another. Look at verse 16. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. Oh, I love this. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. These are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not subject to the law. Did you catch that? Our lives, the life of freedom, is an uncomfortable life <laughs> of this tension between flesh and spirit. Think about it, friends. You know this to be true. If I follow the Spirit, if I boldly follow what God is doing in my life, my flesh is going to gripe. True? How about this, though? If I follow the flesh, if I just do what my desires might want me to do, don't you know that the Spirit will be grieved? Just as true? Oh, yeah. If we sow to the flesh our spirit grieves. If we sow to the spirit, our flesh is going to start barking. We are caught in between. And that's okay. That's the nature of our freedom. Yes, we are free. The spirit of Christ sets us free. But then the question is, what do we do with our freedom? What we do is we live in the tension. We live in the middle, knowing that there's always going to be a bit of a restless gnawing, a reminder that freedom isn't free. It was bought with the price of Christ's life. And it's experienced in our lives only as we take up our cross and follow Him. Something that the Bible rightly calls death to self. This costly freedom is the greatest gift God gives. So friends, let freedom ring. Let it be seen in our service when we lay down our lives for our friends. Let it be expressed in our willingness to follow the Spirit as we take up our cross and follow Jesus in the way of self-surrender. Let freedom ring this weekend. But as we celebrate, please, friends, please don't stop at merely humming America the beautiful, as great as that is. May the song in your heart also be amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Thanks be to God. Jesus is the one who sets us free. Jesus is the one who teaches us to discipline our freedom and turn it in the direction of God and neighbor. Jesus is our great liberator. And knowing him is the true source of our freedom. Friends, if you want to plunge deeper into that freedom, or if you're feeling bound by whatever it is that might have you bound, or if there's some other need weighing heavily on you, oh, it would be my honor to pray with you in these closing moments. If any of those things are what you're feeling this morning, come. I would love to pray with you.
Today's a good day. It's a day of celebration. It's a day of remembering the high cost of freedom and the great gift and the opportunities that come with it. Oh, friends, may you use your freedom well. May God bless you this day and always. Go in peace, ready to serve.